Let's rock and roll. Man, I had these fitted all nicely right as the call started, and then it changed sizes on me. So let me, let me fix my screen share for y'all. Here we are. We're cooking with medicine. I figured this would be a really fun time to bring up this class. That's not what I meant to do right there. It is Monday for me, guys. I am so sorry. Hopefully I'm Hopefully, I am the only one that feels that way, but um, the first herb we're going to talk about is sage, and I love sage, especially this time of year, because immediately I'm like, mm, stuffing and Thanksgiving feasts and all the super yummy stuff, right, and being with your family and the hogs and the quiches and all that kind of good stuff is also really nice, so Sage is a wonderful plant. A lot of the plants we're going to talk about are native to the Mediterranean area, just like this one. And it's been used as medicine and in folklore for thousands upon thousands and thousands of years. The Romans actually created a whole ritual around the process of gathering sage because they felt as if it was a sacred plant. I think a lot of us still do today and many, many cultures have gone on with that belief. So um, I think another thing that you ladies that will really appreciate is that it was always believed that sage thrives when it's being grown in homes that are dominated by women. Fascinating. So I say, grow your sage mamas all the way. Um, the Greeks and the Romans used it a lot for all kinds of medicinal properties. Um, and another cool thing about sage and a lot of the herbs we're going to talk about is that it's got really, really potent antioxidant properties that were used as preservatives to prevent the rancidity of meats and various fats and oils. So interesting that our culinary herbs that we use for so much flavor were also what kept our food good for so stinking long and still to this day. Um, the Arabs in the 10th century believed that it would improve your mental sharpness, wittiness, and quickness. And it was also believed that it made people immortal. So if you're looking to be immortal, sage could be your best friend. Um, it was also believed that it would keep you safe from witchcraft. And then our eclectic physicians in the 1800s, I believe that's the era of the eclectics, they used it a lot for digestive upset, colds and flu, warming the hands and feet. A lot of these things we'll be talking about here in just a minute too. And then sage has quite a few nutritional properties to it. So it's really high in calcium and magnesium and potassium, potassium, potassium. <laughs> and zinc as well as vitamin A too. And here we are, sage is amazing for your digestive health. It's a culinary herb, you're gonna find a big old trend happening through all of these herbs we're talking about today. So it's a carminative. I think quite a few of you know that carminative means it's going to ease gassiness and bloating and tummy upset. If you do not know, now you do. Oftentimes you'll find that carminative herbs are very fragrant and rich in what's called volatile oils. And they're really, really important, especially if we have kiddos dealing with tummy upset or ourselves, right? It's also an antispasmodic. So that just means it's going to um, ease spasms in the smooth muscle tissue and contractions. So our digestive system is filled with smooth muscles and that's when cramping and things like that happen. So the antispasmodic properties of the sage are gonna help ease those kinds of things. Sage is a wonderful bitter herb. Bitter is something you'll hear me talk about often. It's a flavor that in our society we really hate, right? We're trained to love sweet and all the delicious things. But bitter is really important because it stimulates healthy digestion. It helps to break down the fats and proteins from your food as it 
um, is really fantastic for releasing bile and other digestive secretions from the liver and the gallbladder. It's pretty amazing. And it's just going to be really helpful in speeding sluggish digestion, things like that. Sage can be helpful for people dealing with gastritis or a non-ulcer form of dyspepsia, all kinds of digestive upsets, really. Um, and it's a, quite an astringent, so it's going to tone and tighten loose uh, mucus and other tissues. So that's going to be really helpful in the cases of diarrhea as well. It's just really nice to know that so many common ailments that we deal with can be dealt with from our kitchen cabinets. I, I find it fascinating still to this day, even knowing all this stuff and studying it for so long. And I think one of the other fascinating parts is how little we as a society think about these as medicine, even though they're incredibly effective. So let's talk about sage as a woman's medicine. I think a few of you ladies are really going to appreciate some of these things. If you are a nursing mother and you are over it, or you're just, it's that stage of your life where it's time to stop nursing, sage can be a really wonderful ally to help um, decrease the milk flow to dry it up. So a galactagog herb means that it promotes more milk flow. So sage is an anti-galactagog, which sounds really mean. Why would be, we be so anti-galactagogs? But anyways, you get what I mean. It's also a hemostatic herb. So that's going to mean that it's going to be really helpful in reducing excessive bleeding. If you are having extremely heavy menstrual flow, you might want to consider using some sage for those kinds of scenarios. If you are in the menopausal or perimenopausal phases and you're having random spotting, things like that, you might want to consider using more sage in your life. You could do it as a tea. You could make yourself a tincture. You can certainly eat it in your food. Um, and yeah, so really, really helpful in those ways. And give me one second here. Cool. Um, and you ladies dealing with hot flashes or night sweats or just any excessively sweaty people could really benefit from sage. If you're dealing with the hot flashes, though, I'm going to say make yourself a sage tea and put it in the fridge because the last thing you want is a hot cup of tea, right? So that is a good way to go about that. And... Sage is a freaking epic antimicrobial herb. So when I say antimicrobial, that means it's fighting viral infections, fungal infections, and bacterial infections. It's really, really wonderful. So its antibacterial properties are specific for things like sinusitis, laryngitis, strep throat, bronchitis, all of those kinds of bacterial infections of the respiratory tract. You can use a simple tea for those, maybe add a little salt. You can gargle it. You can drink the tea. A salt and sage gargle actually is a really phenomenal, simple home remedy that works um, with those sore throats. So really, really helpful in that. And then just its antiviral properties for colds and flu. It's specific for the herpes virus as well. It's also a great diaphoretic herb. So if somebody does have a fever, you could turn to sage, especially if that's all you've got on hand. When I say that's all, I don't mean it that way because it is powerful. Um, but if it is what you have in your kitchen cabinet, you can totally use that. That's why it's so great in broths and stews and things along those lines. Um, so again, that diaphoretic property means that it's going to release heat from the body via our skin from sweating, which is really helpful in the event of an excessively high fever going on for too long. Again, I, I say this a lot, but I'll say it again, is that... A fever is really a great beneficial process of the body. So we don't always want to suppress it. We don't want to run to aspirin or whatever to lower it. You want to work with the body and the immune system, which is doing an epic job fighting off whatever foreign invaders are there through your fever. It's it's a cool, cool process. And I dive way deeper into that in a whole nother, whole nother thing. Um, 
And yes, it's also an amazing antifungal. So you can use it if somebody's got athlete's foot, you can use it if they've got ringworm or staph infection. If you're dealing with candida, whether it's a digestive candida or a vaginal candida, um, sage can be a really beneficial ally there. Same thing for yeast infections. So it's really a lot going on in there. And it is an excellent astringent. So this goes back to being beneficial for diarrhea because astringents tone and tighten excessive mucus or mucosal tissue. So that's why when most people, when they think of astringent, we're like, oh, that's for my kid's teenage oily skin, you know, but we can use it in so many other ways. Like if you have too much uh, phlegm in the respiratory tract or in the nose, you, if you've got the runny nose, you can use an astringent in those cases. If you've got oily hair or if you've got acne, you can really benefit from sage. You can do a simple sage tea and do it as a wash. Maybe even consider infusing some witch hazel extract with some sage and maybe some other lovely herbs that you know are great astringents for any teenagers that are dealing with a lot of acne or oily skin. You can also use sage as a hair rinse. It is wonderful for getting rid of dandruff and to speed um, hair growth. Add in some rosemary, some nettles, and some horsetail, and you've got like a magical concoction. Infuse all of those herbs into an apple cider vinegar and use that as a hair rinse, and you're going to have the most lustrous, amazing hair. And um, let's see. I repeated my notes on the side here. I'm like, wait, I just said that. It's there it goes again. Um, <laughs> you can also use it for mouth issues. So it's got those antibacterial properties. Bacterial infections happen in the mouth often. If you've got bleeding gums, those astringent properties are going to help tighten and tone that. It's going to be really nice for ulcers of the mouth or canker sores, throat out ulcers, gingivitis, just do a nice mouthwash and rinse it around. It's really going to help a lot. Make a really strong tea though. Super duper easy. And here are many, 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 many other ways that you can use sage. Cook with it, put it in your food. You're going to get so much medicine for it or from it. I will say that, you know, you want to add your fresh herbs a little later in the cooking game. You don't really want them to boil forever if they're leaves and flowers. So please remember that along your herbal journey. Leaves and flowers, you do not want to boil and simmer forever because that is going to evaporate and reduce their medicinal properties. But when we're talking about roots and barks and berries, more dent, dense and hard plant material, that's when you want to simmer or decoct it because that's going to help break down the walls and, and, and get the good medicine out into whatever you are making. So I definitely recommend using the sage. You can do it in an apple cider vinegar extract if I didn't say that already. You could use it topically. Like I said, the witch hazel extract would be a really lovely thing to do. You could infuse it in a salve or an oil into a salve. You can do uh, foot baths if that's what you wanna do with it for sure. Make a sage honey, simple syrup, super duper easy. Make a very strong tea, add in a bunch of sugar, and then you have a sage simple syrup. And of course, the tea I've talked about quite a few times. I will say, if you're going to use it, if you're somebody or helping somebody that has um, maybe a yeast effect infection or candida or anything like that, and you're going to be using it vaginally, please strain it multiple times through a coffee filter because otherwise you're going to end up with a bunch of the part particulate matter in there and we really don't want to do that. Also, if you are going to use sage medicinally as a tea in various ways, make sure that you're just using new tea each day so that you don't introduce more potential bacterial issues going on there. Super duper important. And if you're making a sage tincture, which you can do all of these things with a sage tincture, you may want to dilute it in, in water or what have you. 
But anyways, um, I like to do a fresh sage tincture with a one to two or a one to three ratio from plant to menstruum. And that menstruum would be a 70 to 95% alcohol. And you could also do it with dried sage. You could do a one to five menstruum with a 60% alcohol. Wow. I talked a lot about sage right there. I feel like I'm taking a long time on one herb we've talked about. <laughs> Um, there are some contraindications to consider with sage. If you are pregnant or lactating, do not take it in medicinal doses. Culinary doses are okay. So my pregnant mama's on the call today. Eat your stuffing. <laughs> um, I see your chat. Hold on one second. Yeah, it is a powerhouse. You're going to find this about so many of the herbs we talk about today. That's why I wanted to bring these things to y'all's attention. Like we have so much medicine in our kitchen cabinet and we all really just discount that. We we forget about it because we're just so used to cooking with it. So hopefully as you guys are creating all your feasts this week, then you think about some of the things you learned today. So I know I talked about rosemary for a moment because I have that video just going bonkers. Um, wah, hold on, speaking of bonkers, I just messed up my screen. Okay, sorry, my chat went into crazy places. Uh, rosemary, what a lovely, lovely, lovely plant. So this is something I've always done with rosemary. When I was going through clinical herbal school, we'd have really long intensive classes for like, eight to 10 hours a day. I was in the city and um, on my breaks, I would walk through the neighborhoods in Portland, Oregon, and everybody has a rosemary shrubbery in their yard. And I just put a sprig in my ear. It was always lovely. But the ancient Greek scholars would also wear like a necklace of rosemary during their tests to help with their memory. And they also affiliated Rosemary with the goddess Minerva. I think I said her name right. I could be very wrong. I don't know, but she was the goddess of knowledge, which I think is lovely. Uh, Rosemary was referenced in Hamlet. So Ophelia would hand Hamlet a sprig of rosemary and said, there's rosemary. That's for rem remembrance. Pray, love, remember. Clearly, I'm not a Shakespearean person, but that was in Shakespeare in, in Hamlet. So um, I think that's really, really cool. And it was also said that when rosemary plants thrived, it was another sign that women were in charge. And it created this saying where rosemary flourished, the women ruled. So now you ladies know you got to grow sage, you got to go grow rosemary. <laughs> It was also used in wedding ceremonies. So they would tr um, create these wreaths with the rosemary for the bride that symbolized fidelity. They would also give the rosemary sprigs wrapped in some beautiful, colorful silk ribbons to show love and loyalty for their guests as well. And they would also burn rosemary as incense. You can totally do this still today. It was a better alternative than like frankincense or myrrh because they were really expensive. And they would also use those burned rosemary sticks to fumigate the sick rooms in hospitals and with the intention of preventing further infection. In Spain and Italy, they would hang sprigs of rosemary over their doors to protect from evil witches. And they would also put it under their beds for nightmares. I don't know about y'all. I think it's fun to learn about the history. Maybe it's just like, I just want to know about the medicine. You guys let me know because that'll help dictate classes in the future. If you just want the medicine and don't want to know the history. But for me, the history is fun. It, I think it's also sometimes important to know. Obviously, you can use it as medicine without understanding that. Oh, yay, Jennifer, that's so good to know. I'm glad you like it. Um, cool. Let me not let my chat freak out and put it into another location so I can keep it happy on my screen and see all my notes and all that fun stuff. Um, let's talk briefly about some of the nutritional value of rosemary uh, beyond it being delicious <laughs> and making you really smart. It is loaded with vitamin C, calcium, magnesium, zinc, potassium, iron, um, it's also loaded with antioxidants that are going to prevent free radical damage and really make for a great preventative for Alzheimer's and dementia. 
and it's yummy. <laughs> and there's a compound in rosemary that's rosmarinic acid. It's a volatile oil that has really potent antimicrobial actions that are phenomenal from for fighting colds and flu. Mackenzie, let me know how that works out for you. I'm really excited to hear that. It's exciting. I'm sorry that you deal with nightmares though. Um, you can also use rosemary, obviously it's antiviral. So it's gonna fight off flus and colds, things like that. It's also a really great expectorant herb and an astringent. So if you have really stuck, nasty, phlegmy, congested coughs, rosemary can be a really, really great friend. It's another one like sage. You can do that uh, gargle. You can drink it as a tea. It's going to help break, break all that nastiness up. Um, this goes for time, which we'll be talking about in a little while too, but all three of those are herbs I would absolutely consider doing herbal steams with when you're stuck and congested. Works like magic. I'm, I, I poop you not. Um, just put some herbs, whichever ones you got on hand, if they're fragrant, filled with these volatile oils, then you are going to get a lot of that steam and vapor when you put it into a bowl, pour some hot water over it and drape a towel over your head. It's amazing. Like straight up amazing. People will call me up. I'm like, what do you got in your kitchen? Because you got a lot of medicine. Um, Let's see. It's also another diaphoretic. So it definitely does a great job of easing fever and colds and flu. You guys are probably thinking a lot about soups and stew. Yeah, so much to grow this spring for sure, especially if you're the lady running your house. Um, you can use it for as an antibacterial, various wounds, keeping the infection out from there, staph infection, um, all those nasty things. You can also use it for ringworm as an antifungal, um, candida overgrowth, all kinds of good ways to use this plant as medicine. It's also a phenomenal vasodilator, which means it's going to open up and dilate the blood vessels going to be extremely helpful for people that have circulatory weakness. This is going to show as uh, spider veins, varicose veins, and just cold fingers and toes. Rosemary is for sure a friend for those people. You can use it topically for the spider veins or varicose veins in an oil, and then definitely drink it internally because it's really going to promote all that blood flow throughout the entire body. It's really wonderful if you are dealing with low blood pressure and it just helps to um, increase the overall integrity of your blood vessels. So if you are somebody that has some pretty weak or fragile or really permeated blood vessels and capillaries, rosemary can be a valuable asset to you. And it improves the memory. It brings all of that blood flow, brings so many nutrients and oxygen up to the brain. And it's known to help people concentrate as well as treating people that actually are dealing with a lack of oxygen to the brain. It's actually got over 12 different antioxidant compounds that um, decrease oxidation in your cells and ultimately reduce inflammation. Um, I think I, I drink rosemary every day, darn near. It's in my Where Is My Mind tea blend that I used at Mountain Mel's. But here's a tea that I think would be wonderful for any of you that are like, can I please think better? Um, use Tulsi rosemary, go to cola, ginkgo biloba, and maybe maybe a touch of mint if you want, but the Tulsi is going to add such great flavor too. But bringing those all together are going to do amazing things for your brain health overall. And then the rosemary is just really going to amplify the circulation and ensure that those other amazing herbs are getting to the noggin right where they need to be. And surprise, surprise, rosemary is great for digestion. <laughs> so it is a digestive stimulant. Maybe you've eaten too much over the holidays and you're like sitting on the couch going, oh my God, what did I do? 
Rosemary is going to help move things through. She's another bitter herb. So that's going to st stimulate the digestive secretions to flow from your liver and help break down fats and proteins in the body. She's known to lower cholesterol le levels and triglycerides. Um, she's for somebody that is uh, not eating and has no appetite, rosemary can stimulate that appetite. And she does a really, really great job of reducing intestinal and gallbladder spasms. That's not all, everybody. <laughs> you can use rosemary for your skin. She's particularly beneficial for those with dry or more mature skin. She is known to help prevent wrinkles and just give an overall refreshing rejuvenation to the skin. She is an amazing hair rinse. I talked about briefly with the sage. Um, rosemary is phenomenal for hair regrowth. You can make a nice light rosemary oil and do a little conditioning there. And then you can also use an apple cider vinegar. She's gonna prevent the balding and just, she's so nice. Um, you could also use her topically for reducing bruising, for people dealing with sore muscles, those de dealing with neuralgic pain. If you are dealing with rheumatic or arthritic pains, rosemary can be a really great ally topically for sure. And there are so many ways you can use her. As I've mentioned, teas and gargles. You can make a tincture with her. I would do a one to two or a one to three ratio with that in a 70 to 95% alcohol with the fresh plant matter. If I was doing dried, I'd go one to five, maybe a one to seven and 60% alcohol. Jennifer, I wish I could hear your voice right now so I could know how to pronounce your last name, but I think it's Wybush. I think, I don't know. Um, sorry if I murdered that, but you could murder my last name. People have done it all my life. <laughs> um, I made a rosemary infused, Weebush, got it. I made a rosemary infused oil and added rosemary and peppermint essential oil to my post-COVID hair loss oil. Nice. So is that a thing like losing hair after COVID? Because I got COVID in July and I have been losing hair like a freak show. And I talked to my, I have a certified nurse practitioner that I work with and she's, she's like, I have been seeing it off the charts, like out of the blue, everybody's losing their hair mysterious um so yeah if you guys anybody else knows of that i'd love to hear what's going as a on a hairdresser i have seen a lot of it really oh and my just gosh since COVID. Yes. yeah it's yeah. insane yeah yeah huh yeah yeah she so jennifer's saying she went to her dermatologist and said they've seen a ton of it too yeah i'm losing astronomical mm -hmm. amounts and fortunately like I had a lot of hair to begin with, but now I'm like, wait a second. I always said that I'd have my hair and personality forever. So if I get wrinkly and all the other things, I'm fine. But no, my hair, my hair's going away. What am I going to do? Um, okay. Interesting. Isn't that fascinating? Mm -hmm. Oh, everybody. Uh, they said that one of the drugs was, that was one of the side effects with the drugs that treated COVID in the beginning when they first started treating it one particular way. Uh, but then I've seen it not not necessarily caused by the drug, but just from the virus itself. Yeah, so. it must be the virus because I, I didn't use any drugs. I mean, I, I've been vaccinated, um, but I did not use any drugs for my COVID treatment when it did come around. So weird. Yeah, yeah. I'm so curious Such, what, that, yeah. what that is. Such a mystery there. Huh. Two thirds of your hair. Yeah, Terry, that's where I feel like I'm at already. It's preposterous. Let's all use some rosemary and sage and nettles and horsetail. <laughs> um, you can also put rosemary in oils and use it as salves and lotions and creams and all kinds of great things. Rosemary also, just on another note, the essential oil or just a little bit of rosemary oil can act as a really great preserv preservative for the rest of your oils. So keep that in mind. And as far as contraindications with rosemary, avoid medicinal use during pregnancy. The culinary use is just fine. Um, if you have blocked bile ducts, rosemary is not your friend. And definitely do not use the essential oil during pregnancy or lactation or for children under 10. And if you have epilepsy, let's take a little timeline. 
I'm cheesy. So thyme is pretty amazing. It was another one of those herbs that was used to fumigate the air, especially in sick rooms and hospitals. It was considered a compliment to smell of thyme by the Greeks. They really held it pretty highly regarded. They would get honey from Mount Hematis, I believe is how it's pronounced. Um, and they always said that that was the best because it was just this hillside filled with thyme and the bees were probably buzzing in absolute joy. So that was the best honey, the thyme honey. It was also known as a symbol of bravery. So women would embroider these scarves with a little thyme sprig and a bee hovering over that sprig and they would give them to their knights as a sign of honor. In the Welsh, they would go to funerals and they would either plant a thyme plant or toss a sprig of thyme on top of the graves um, as just a, a sign of honor. And of course, it's been used as medicine for thousands and thousands of years for so many different ways from using it for gout or sciatica and warts and colds and flu and tummy upset and all the things that we'll dive into. And yet it was another culinary herb that was amazing for preserving preserving meats and such. And I think this one is really fascinating. So time is amazing. I don't know if you guys have heard me say this before, but a large amount of our pharmaceutical drugs are derived from the medicinal constituents of plants. And thyme is one of those that is used in so many over-the-counter cold, cold and flu remedies that are out there. So it's really rich in this constituent thymol and carvacrol, um, but the thymol specifically is used in all kinds of expectorants and antivirals and other antibacterial drugs and things that are specific for cold and flu and respiratory infections. Um, and it's a really, really powerful antimicrobial. It can fight off the viruses, the, the bacteria and the fungal infections. It's really great for stomach flu or mono, mononucleosis. <laughs> And then for cold and flu in general, if you're dealing with staph infections, laryngitis, sinusitis, athlete's foot, ringworm, all of these things you can turn to time for. And it's another one that's a great expectorant. It's really specific for those that are dealing with like really dry um, coughs with kind of a white clearish phlegm that doesn't really come up very well. It's kind of stuck. Like somebody who might have bronchitis, it's going to be helpful in whooping cough, pneumonia, pertussis. Time is going to be a really, really helpful ally as it gets all that nastiness out. Can also get rid of the congestion in the nasal passages as well. And yes, it's another diaphoretic. And I think I say that word a lot. I think you guys are all, oh, we've got a couple of new, new mamas in here, but diaphoretic simply means that it's going to help release heat from the body. So it's really helpful um, towards the ending sessions of a fever. And another one for healthy digestion. So it's a carminative. It's going to ease the gassiness and the bloating. Put it in your soups and your stews and your broths. It can be really great for those dealing with sluggish di digestion or dyspepsia or diarrhea. It's really, I, I forgot to mention some of its nutrients or did I? I think I forgot to, but it does have calcium. It's got chromium. It's got iron. It's got magnesium, selenium, selenium um, vitamin A, zinc, fiber, niacin, phosphorus, all kinds of good stuff and we can grow it so easily in our gardens. It's another amazing herb for the liver. So the choleretic properties mean it's going to be promoting healthy digestion by helping the liver, liver the liver. <laughs> The liver release bile and other digestive secretions um, and to break down all kinds of fats and proteins. And you can use time for all these things too. So if you're dealing with various mouth infections, it can be really, really helpful. They actually use that time all 
uh, and the essential oil of thyme in mouthwash like Listerine. Um, it's used in a lot of different toothpastes as well. It's used in Vicks VapoRub, all of these things, and it's you can grow it so easily. And it is a circulatory stimulant and a counter irritant. So that means if you've got like pain and inflammation in a particular area, using this particular herb topically can take away some of that pain and inflammation. It's gonna be really nice for those dealing with sore muscles, varicose veins, sprains, strains, bruising. Um, rheumatic and arthritic pains. You can use her as a wound wash. You can use her in a fungal foot bath or for ringworm, all those fun things. And it's super duper easy to use. You can do honeys and syrups. You can do poultices. So taking the fresh plant matter or the dried plant matter and getting it all wet and placing it topically on whatever particular area you're trying to treat. You can do the foot bath. You can do vinegar extracts. I mean, we've all done the fire cider, right? That's a vinegar extract. You can make a tincture with it. Um, you can cook with it. <laughs> For the tincture, you're going to go for like a one to one to four ratio with an 80 to 95% alcohol. And if that's with fresh plant matter, if you're doing dried, you would do a one to five. Uh, Jennifer, which would be best for strep? I would make a tea and then do a continuous gargle with it. Make a really, really strong tea. I would add in the sage. I mean, we're talking about a lot of herbs that are going to be really fantastic for um, if you're talking strep throat or if you're talking streptococcus, it really depends on which which variable <laughs> we're talking about there. Um, yeah, so consider that. Um, if you're doing the tincture, you want to aim for 15 to 90 drops a day of the tincture about three to four times daily. And yeah, I would definitely, you know, put it in your soups and your stews and sip on that broth to soothe the respiratory, to soothe the the throat and do gargles and drink the tea and all of those fun, fun things. Sorry, if that's what you're dealing with in your house, that's not fun. I'll take away the fun. <laughs> um, honey, so you can infuse it in honey. If you do have the essential oil of thyme, you could do like one drop of thyme essential oil to two to four tablespoons of honey mix all of that together and then that's your thyme honey and then put that in your water hot water or teas things like that and you're going to get a lot of those medicinal benefits out of there and then as far as contraindications there's not much going on if you are pregnant do not be taking thyme essential oil internally use it for food, no doubt. Um, if you're allergic to mint family herbs, don't take mint family herbs. Pretty simple one. <laughs> and one of my favorite herbs, garlic. Of course it has a huge history as food and medicine. Um, it's believed, from what I've heard, is that it originated in the high plains of West Central Asia. It was commonly used for, for tuberculosis, dysentery, of course, common cold and flus and all kinds of digestive upset. The Greeks used it for asthmatic cough um, as a suppressant and also for intestinal parasites. Pliny the Elder, he used it as the antidote to snake bites. Um, garlic was used for as an enema to treat pinworms. I wonder if people still do that today. It's also loaded with vitamins and minerals. It's got B6 and C and manganese and selenium and phosphorus and calcium and iron and copper and potassium and yummy yum. I love garlic. Um, garlic is phenomenal for cardiovascular and heart health. And as I talk about some of these things, we're going to go over really quickly. Just remember that our heart is really important. Use garlic as a preventative. But if you're really dealing with some major heart health issues, you want to work with somebody on that um, and not just say, oh, garlic will fix it all, though it fixes a lot. <laughs> um, 
And again, it's a, it's a really great preventative. It does a great job of decreasing the plaque buildup on arterial walls, and it does a great job of preventing arthrosclerosis in the first place. So that's hardening of the arteries or too much plaque on, on the uh, vessels. And it will also do a great job of thinning really thick viscous blood, which is going to reduce the risk of stroke and heart attack. It's going to lower total blood serum cholesterol levels and lower triglycerides. It lowers the bad cholesterol, the LDL, the low density lipids, and will help to increase the good cholesterol, which is your HDL or high density lipoprotein cholesterol. It is wonderful to help those dealing with um, hypertension or high blood pressure. It's going to help dilate peripheral blood vessels and increases the total volume of blood to your capillaries, ultimately lowering blood pressure. It's amazing. Did I mention that yet? Because it's true. <laughs> it's also a great immunomodulator. So it's going to strengthen and support the immune system throughout the entire year. Um, it increases natural killer cell activity and activates your lymphocytes and all these cool guys that go hard to work inside of your immune system. It's an amazing antiviral herb that has been shown to fight off the herpes virus, both one and two, fights off parainfluenza type three, it fights off rhinovirus, just to name a few of those that it's amazing for. I highly recommend using raw fresh garlic for these particular properties. It's also really great for fighting off allergies. It reduces the release of histamine, histamines from your mast cells. Pretty neato. It's an amazing antibacterial herb. It's amazing, amazing. So there's a constituent in it called allicin, A-L-L-I-C-I-N. And there have been many studies showing that allicin being comparable to using antibiotics like penicillin or tetracycline. As I say that, if you need the antibiotics, do the antibiotics. I'm just sharing scientific facts and study and data. <laughs> Always good to say to, to work with your doctor or find somebody that you trust if yours sucks, which a lot of them do. Um, as far as garlic and its bacterial antibacterial properties, when I was pregnant, I had group B streptococcus and I um, was told I'd have to take antibiotics. And I was like, I don't want to take antibiotics because I knew that would go straight to my unborn child's gut and start her off on a bad path with a jacked up gut. So I opted to take usnea and garlic and I would score the garlic because for the allicin to be released, you need to have it crushed or chopped up that gets all the good stuff out. And then I wrapped a string around it and I stuck it up in all the beautiful places and I would leave it in there overnight while I slept. And a week later went, got, and went back and got tested and I was negative on group B strep which is really funny because everything on the internet is like, nope, you have to do the antibiotics. And I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> Thankfully, I've got an amazing doctor who is my midwife. She's my naturopath and she's brilliant and was like, yep, do what you got to do. Um, so I was really fortunate for that. Um, oh, thanks. Yeah, I was really stubborn in those days. <laughs> and um yeah, it's it's amazing what you can do with plant medicine. And I was really deep in my like clinical studies when I was pregnant too. Um, you can use garlic as uh, an antifungal in amazing ways. If you are dealing with vaginal candida, you can do exactly what I did with group B strep. Um, you do want to tie a string around it and basically use it like a tampon and um, be careful replace the garlic every three hours or so. And if you feel excessive heat, because garlic is very, very hot and can be caustic, um, stop using it. <laughs> Use it in, in, in an infused oil could be a little bit more helpful, but you really do want to be careful of not introducing other bacteria. So, um, 
Garlic is phenomenal as an ear oil for the littles when they have an ear ache. So you're just gonna infuse it in some olive oil. You can use mullen with this also. The garlic mullen combo is amazing. And you're just going to place a few drops into the ear canal at the beginning stages of an ear infection and rub and massage around that whole area. Maybe place a heating pad there to give them some relief and love. It is important that if you're going to go with this method, you also are taking on other antibacterial herbs internally just to ensure that you're killing off all the bacteria causing the infection or you run the risk of actually doing more damage to the inner ear and that could result in total hearing loss. So be careful. Um, and if these herbs are not working for your kiddo with an earache, go to the doctor. Speaking from a girl who's had ear surgery 13 times and has a fake eardrum and drilled into my mastoid gland and three bent bones taken out and replaced with cartilage, pay attention to those ears. <laughs> also, if you're dealing with concur or recurring ear infections, consider eliminating dairy. Surprise, guys, it's another carminative and gut loving um, culinary herb. It's Monday, guys. Bear with me. My brain has just been like, what? No, you don't want to work today. But I do. Um, garlic is amazing for gut health. It reduces the bad gut bugs, our gut bug enemies, and will actually improve our microflora in the gut by encouraging more of those good gut bugs to grow, especially when you're doing that fermented garlic or lacto-fermented, um, putting garlic in your kimchi and, and your sauerkrauts, all those kinds of things. Uh, it's been fantastic for food poisoning and treating dysentery. It's also really, really wonderful for H. pylori, which is um, basically these germs that get into your body through your digestive tract. And after many years, they ultimately end up causing sores or ulcers in the lining of your stomach or maybe even part of your small intestine. And for some people, H. pylori can lead to stomach cancer. Obviously, we don't want that. Uh, it's actually really, really common, H. pylori. Most of us, about two thirds of the world's population has it in their bodies. So garlic is a, a really powerful friend in that way. Um, yep. I love me some garlic. So put it in your food. It, the most medicinal properties you're going to get from garlic and do come from it when it is raw. And garlic raw is really, really hot. <laughs> it's not easy to take in. So I know I started all of you guys out with some raw garlic honey, and that really tones down the heat. And of course, if you're using a good quality honey, you get all the medicinal benefits from that as well. Yes, absolutely put it in apple cider vinegars. My partner is a ski bum for life. He he works in the ski industry. He has for the past 20 plus years. And he lives in ski boots and winter boots in the colder years. And he gets the foot funk. He gets athlete's foot. So we'll take like a clove of garlic and puree that with some apple cider vinegar and maybe make a really strong calendula or any of the other herbs we've talked about because they're all antifungal, right? Um, make a tea with them and then put that, put, make a foot bath with all of that kind of concoction together. And it works really, really well. Infuse garlic in your oils. Eat it, eat it, eat it. Uh, anybody you think of other great ways to get raw garlic into your body? You can put it in olive oil raw, and that's a really fantastic marinade or salad dressing. Uh, do be careful because it can go bad. Um, you can make a garlic tincture for sure. That would be a really, really hot tincture. So be careful. And speaking of be careful, um, well, let's move into contraindications. 
<laughs> pregnant ladies, limited use. Use it for food in lots and lots of ways. There's no actual contraindications, but the biggest issue is that it can cause gassiness and digestive upset for you and for your baby. If you are breastfeeding, same thing. If you've got a colicky baby, you may want to consider reducing or taking garlic out of your diet. Um, excessive use of garlic. It's again, it's really hot. So it can cause nausea. It can cause heartburn. It can cause digestive upset. It can definitely cause excessive gassiness. So if you are feeling any of these symptoms, lower your garlic intake, if not completely quit for a while and give your body a moment to rest. If you have ulcers or hiatal hernia, or if you're dealing with acid reflux or acid indigestion, other like major inflammatory issues of the digestive tract, avoid raw garlic consumption. And then if you are going into surgery or if um, you know you're going into labor soon, two weeks prior to either of those happening, you do not want to be taking garlic medicinally because it is a blood thinner and that could become problematic. Same thing with postpartum and post-op. If you are on statins or anti-hypertensive drugs or other blood thinning drugs, definitely work with your healthcare practitioner. And again, use caution when it's on the skin, you'll see it get red and inflamed. That's a sign that it's too hot and you want to take it easy. Either lower the amount you're using or completely quit. A lot on garlic. There's so much more like I could talk for the next week and a half just on garlic and its medicine, but we'll talk about ginger next instead. <laughs> Ah, beautiful ginger, another one that's been used for thousands and thousands of years. It is still very frequently used in traditional Chinese medicine. There's actually recordings of its medicinal use as early as 2000 BCE in a document called the Shennong Beng Gao Fing. And I'm sure I murdered that because I do not speak Chinese, but that's what it's called. <laughs> and it's it, garlic is talked about, or I'm sorry, ginger is talked about a lot in there. It is also talked about in Sanskrit literature, Greek, Roman, Arabic, all of those people have and do continue to use ginger as medicine. It was often used to stimulate digestion, to alleviate coughs, to treat asthma and eliminate parasites and deal with arthritis, just to name a few different things. And people who practice Ayurvedic medicine still today regard this as the great universal medicine, which makes a lot of sense because there is a lot going on inside of ginger and it's really good food and it's loaded with magnesium and manganese and potassium and fiber and calcium and chromium and iron and protein and phosphorus and all kinds of good things. <laughs> vitamin A and vitamin C. And it's amazing for digestion. It's actually known to bring a lot of digestive fire uh, or agni to the digestive system. It stimulates and brings blood and circulation to all of the digestive organs and the reproductive organs. It's really fantastic for those dealing with nausea, whether it's um, a post-operative nausea, morning sickness, seasickness. For seasickness, it is best taken four hours prior to heading out to sea. Um, let me see. Uh, it does a great job, of course, it's a carminative, so it's going to ease the gassiness and the bloating and the tummy upset. It's really great if you've got just sluggish digestion, dyspepsia, if you're dealing with diarrhea, it can be a really great ally. It is fantastic. Get some ginger on board if you're dealing with food poisoning or for those dealing with IBS, you could consider ginger as a friend. Um, it's also a great choleretic, so it's going to increase bile secretions and help your body to break down fats and proteins. It helps to lower cholesterol absorption. It lowers the serum cholesterol levels as well as hepatic cholesterol levels, and it reduces liver toxicity, which is fantastic. It's actually, there's a constituent in ginger, which um, is called zingibane. And it is a 
proteolytic protein digesting enzyme. And it has about 80 times by weight, the amount of digestive enzymes of a papaya. So I know papaya's digestive enzymes are very popular, but you could also utilize ginger and really get incredible results. And these enzymes increase the effectiveness of other antibiotics by over 50%. And they're really, really helpful to eliminate harmful parasites as well. Ginger's another one. <laughs> so uh, these slides are relatively new for me and I've never seen this girl working out, but... <laughs> It makes me chuckle. <laughs> um, yeah, Ginger is another great ally for heart and circulatory health. She's going to help lower blood pressure for those that are dealing with high blood pressure. She's really helpful in atherosclerosis, which is hardening up the arteries again. I spoke about in ginger or garlic. Um, she's really loaded with antioxidants that are specific for protecting the blood vessels and preventing all of that arterial plaque buildup. She increases the contractions of the heart muscle and makes those contractions stronger. She is an amazing circulatory stimulant and she does a great job of bringing all kinds of nutrients and the oxygen via the blood to all of your organs and tissues, helping them to work much better. If you are somebody who is always cold all of the time and dealing with cold fingers and toes, Ginger is your friend. And she's amazing for inflammation. So there's a lot of anti-inflammatory compounds going on inside of ginger. And she's wonderful if you are a lady who deals with menstrual cramps. Some really strong ginger rhizome tea during your period can be really, really helpful. You could even consider doing some type of like castor oil ginger pack on the abdomen around the uterine area. Um, really great for digestive cramping as well. Do use the raw rhizome. So ginger is not a root, despite what we all commonly call it. She's a rhizome of a plant. Um, and most of the great medicine there comes from the raw stuff as well. So she's super helpful if you are somebody dealing with the pain from rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis. If you are dealing with joint and muscle pain, you can use her internally for the anti-inflammatory properties. You can also make an oil out of ginger. I use ginger in my bobcat balm. Um, Carol, that stuff that you have has ginger in it for this very, very reason. And she's absolutely fantastic. Um, She's great for drawing things out to a head. So if it's acne, big old zits that just need to like get over it, if we're dealing with boils or abscesses, um, even a splinter, you could turn to ginger. I'm definitely also going to be adding some plantain in the, the picture myself. Um, yeah, super, super helpful plant and super helpful in these ways as well more antimicrobial properties, right? That's why a simple cup of ginger, honey, and lemon at the onset of illness actually works wonders. It's also fantastic for clearing up any kind of stuck congestion, especially if you've got like the white clear mucus, it's kind of dry, which is interesting because um, ginger is a hot herb, but it does a great job of breaking all of that stuff up. Um, what else? Colds, flu, rhinovirus, all of those kinds of things. She's a great antibacterial, specifically if you're dealing with food poisoning or you've got salmonella, E. coli, those kinds of things, um, staph infections, strep, ginger, cheese your body. And of course, obviously we want to use her in food, right? You can also make her, as I said, with tea, as Carol loves to do, infuse a ginger honey. How delicious is that? Then you can use all that honey on like some broccoli or stir fried, whatever you want. And it's going to be absolutely delicious. Um, you can do a ginger glyceride. It's going to be a little less hot and potent for the littles. You can do a tincture, one to two, in a 70 to 95% alcohol. It's going to be hot. 
short, but good. <laughs> really, really good. If you're doing the glycerin, do a one to three ratio. So one part ginger with a three part of the menstruum. And I would do a mix of 50% glycerin, 50% alcohol. And contraindications for ginger. If you're pregnant, poor mamas, <laughs> don't use it as medicine, but use it in your food. But you still get plenty. You can use it as medicine if you've got colds or flu and you're drinking some tea and things like that. You're going to be just fine. Um, if you are somebody who is dealing with acid reflux or heartburn or you've got ulcers and you feel more aggravation when you take ginger, stop taking ginger. Um, if you are on blood thinners, talk with your doc and be cautious with ginger. If you have blocked bile ducts, be cautious in avoiding ginger. And again, watch for those topical applications because it is a very, very hot, hot herb. It's a lot of stuff. <laughs> like, oh, we still have so many more herbs to talk about. Um, oregano. This one's beautiful. Um, everybody loves it these days. They consider it like the holy grail of herbs these days. It seems to be on TikTok. And I'm like, come on, there's so many others. Um, but it does have some great aromatic properties. It's got a lot of similar properties to the rosemary and to the thyme and to the sage that we've already talked about. Aristotle um, saw that turtles ingested oregano after eating a snake. So then he started to use it as the antidote to snake bites and poison. <laughs> the Greeks and Romans regarded it as a symbol of happiness and joy. And so they would adorn their brides and their grooms in crowns of oregano at their wedding ceremonies. Today, it's grown all over the world. It's super duper easy for you to grow in your garden. It is loaded with antioxidants that prevent the rancidity of meats and fats and oils. So it's great for curing of those things. Um, loaded with nutritional properties, potassium, iron, phosphorus, calcium, zinc, niacin. Um, yeah, a lot of similarities in all those Mediterranean herbs. Anybody else catching on that? Oh, uh, curing meat. Yeah. Doing that. Like it can, it, you can, what are you doing? Are you saturating your meat and like an oregano oil and it's going to cure it or? I don't know. I've never done it this way. This is just what they did it historically to preserve all of their meats. Like they would use these herbs because they were so loaded with various antioxidants that kept their meats good longer when there was no such thing as electricity and refrigeration. Okay. I don't know how they did it. Um, I would assume probably, that maybe uh, it was wrapped up in the meat. That, like, yeah, that's what I'm thinking now. More, yeah. you know, just covering it, totally saturating it. Mm -hmm. That's my cool. assumption. Isn't that cool? Yeah, it Crazy. is. And then grieving and loss, grieving the loss of a loved one. Mm -hmm. um, oh, a loved on. <laughs> a loved on. Yeah. Just to say one. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, hmm. Interesting. Yeah, isn't it? I mean, yeah, I'm excited that Mackenzie is going to use the rosemary under her bed to see if it helps with the nightmares. And I'm wondering, like, is anybody else going to try some of these um, little historical things that they've been used for? It's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. And how we've lost touch with all of this stuff as humanity, you know, we're so, so wrapped up in our convenient lifestyle. Um, another antimicrobial, right? It is a phenomenal antiviral herb. Uh, great for colds and flu and mono. It's an amazing uh, antifungal. If you are dealing with digestive candida, vaginal candida, ringworm, athlete's foot, staph infection, really, really nice um, for antibacterial properties. So bronchitis, strep throat, gen, um, sinusitis, staph infection, laryngitis. If you are somebody that is dealing with bacterial vaginosis and or candida, um, you can use oregano, maybe add in some usnea, calendula, organ grape, and spalanthes. You could even consider thyme in there <laughs> um, and use that internally through the mouth, not vaginally for um, take that combo of tincture 
internally 30 to 90 drops up to four times daily. Um, that will be a superpower. I'm going to get you kind of medicine. Um, yep. Yeah, good for the digestive system. <laughs> it's got a, a lot of the same constituents that you find in thyme, the thymol it has. And um, that is responsible for the bactericidal and antiparasitic and fungicidal properties of oregano and thyme. So it'll fight off giardia and pinworms and hookworms, um, which is really nice. It also speeds up all the sluggish digestion. It's going to be really helpful for anybody dealing with non-ulcer dyspepsia. If you're dealing with colic or indigestion or flatulence or diarrhea, um, consider oregano. It's, it's a great one. I mean, I just find it so funny if you guys have mentioned this a time or two, but picking it up on these Mediterranean herbs and how much they really have in common for their medicinal properties, for their historical uses, for their folkloric uses. It's, it's fascinating. Maybe that's why the Mediterranean diet is so highly regarded for optimal health. Um, use oregano as a mouthwash. It'll be really wonderful for uh, bacterial infections. If you've got gingivitis, bleeding of gums, it can be really helpful there. You can use it topically for sprains and strains, for muscle pain, joint pain, bruising, all kinds of things. <laughs> and I just think it's so funny. It's so simple. They're like such common herbs that we all have around. And they've got so much medicine in them. Yeah, everybody wants to go find the next big thing or what have you, but we have it all. Um, these are ways you can use oregano. Definitely put it in your ACV. ACV meaning apple cider vinegar. You can tincture your oregano. You can put it in honeys and simple syrups and capsules and eat it. Use it as a steam, put it in your broths, uh, make infused oils with it, make salves, make creams. Be very, very cautious with the essential oil as it is extremely hot, 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 hot. And we'll talk about that more now. Um, mamas, pregnant mamas, lactating mamas, do not consume the essential oil of anything or oregano during pregnancy. Um, you can use oregano culinary and for your food. Be very, very cautious on the skin. Um, topical use of EA can cause skin to get too hot. That's what that's supposed to say. Again, did I mention I didn't review my slides before I, <laughs> I went into today? Um, and do not allow children under 10 to consume the essential oil. I'm not a huge fan of consuming essential oils in any way, shape, or form. Anyways, um, especially here, because it's so hot, it can burn mucous membranes, and you're really going to need to heavily dilute it. So I would go for no more than a 1%, honestly. Let's talk briefly about cinnamon. Um, I love cinnamon and it has been used for culinary and medicinal purposes, purposes. My mouth still doesn't work. It's like Mel, it's Monday. I do not talk to you. Um, it was actually at one time literally considered worth more, worth its weight in gold. And then some, it was such a highly regarded spice. Um, and cinnamon is a tree bark, right? So there's people actually like peeling this bark off and it comes in those cool little cinnamon sticks, which are technically called quills, which I think is really fun to share with people. Um, let's see. Yeah, think of those lovely farmers when you're making Christmas cookies and things that work so hard to get that cinnamon bark off of those trees and give them a thank you from your home to their hearts. Um, it was actually used by the ancient Egyptians as part of the embalming process, which is fascinating. I wonder if there's like tons of cinnamon around all those tombs and things. Um, and it was and still very much is used for abdominal pain and diarrhea, vomiting, cold, flu, uh, heavy menstrual flow. The eclectics used it as a hemostatic for menstrual cramping and heavy bleeding. Um, yeah, 
It's also got some great nutritional properties to it. It's loaded with iron and magnesium um, <laughs> and zinc and it's yummy. Oh, can I did a homeschool class using the cinnamon sticks from my kit. I wanna know what you did with them. Tell me, I love that story. I hope all your medicine making came out really, really wonderfully. And cinnamon is another amazing one um, if you are dealing with circulatory health issues. If you have cold hands and feet all of the time, cinnamon can be a really, really wonderful friend for you. If you need um, a little oomph to your rep reproductive organs, cinnamon can be a great friend. You can get real crafty with cinnamon. All kinds of winks, winks, and nods, nods. Um, have fun with that. <laughs> and be gentle. <laughs> Coconut oil is great. Um, yes, so it's going to stimulate healthy digestion. It's going to warm the digestive organs as well. If you are somebody who is dealing with really heavy bleeding, maybe you've got uterine fibroids or cysts or just have heavy periods, you could really benefit from using cinnamon. There's an argonon cinnamon that midwives will use for hemorrhaging um, during labor that is really beneficial. Um, and I love cinnamon. It's yummy. Uh, it also is really fantastic for reducing sugar cravings, even though we add it to tons of sugary things during this time of year. I put cinnamon in my coffee every single morning. Like I pour my cup of coffee and I sprinkle cinnamon on top of it and I drink it up. I absolutely love it. Um, let's see. Yeah, so consider more cinnamon if you are somebody who is addicted to the evil drug of sugar. It can be a really great helper. Um, it's a great tummy soother. It is a demulcent, which is specific for the digestive tract. So it's going to be cooling and coating and soothing. It can be really, really helpful for somebody who has diarrhea as well. Uh, Jennifer, you could absolutely use a tea for heavy periods. There is um, an extract that Herb Farm makes. You could probably find it through full script. That is Ergonon. I want to say it's E-R-G-E-N-O-N. -E I could be off on my spelling there, um, but it's phenomenal for heavy periods. The tea is going to be okay. I would go for something stronger because you're going to have to drink a lot of tea to get the really strong medicinal benefits there. And that strong of a tea, like why, why do that to yourself? We can just be like, bam, got you with the tincture. <laughs> um, let's see. It's another carminative. It's going to ease the gassiness and bloating and tummy upset. It also fights off all kinds of, oh yeah, I love to use it with ginger in a tea for a lot of these things. It just brings more heat to it and helps fight off more infection as well. And it's another one that's going to fight off candida. It will help fight off thrush too. It is fantastic for oral health. Add a little cinnamon, make a little hippie toothpaste with some cinnamon. And it's got great antibacterial and fungal properties for overall oral health. Actually, I'm going to invite, um, there's a really brilliant herbalist who specializes in herbal dental care. And I'm going to invite her to see if she'll teach a class for us in 2023. I'm getting excited with like the list of people I'm, I'm looking to have come on board and teach as well. I'll make sure that they're really, really good in like their one area. If you guys have been with me for a while, you're probably learning by now that this is a complex subject. <laughs> of herbalism. There's there's really a lot going on and there's a lot to talk about, a lot to learn about. And um, there are definitely people, it's like, you know, you got your heart surgeons and you got your ER doctors and you got your family practice people and same thing goes with herbalism. Um, yeah, use your cinnamon with your kiddos. I think this is a really nice one because it's really tasty. Infuse some cinnamon with honey and put that in a hot water for them. If they're feeling yucky, it's going to be a little bit more like a treat for them. I'm going to share with you guys some cinnamon gummies that are pretty amazing in the recipes. I'll put it in the download section of the recordings here. 
And then, yeah, here's all the other ways that I just spoke about. <laughs> Apparently, I'm supposed to look at my slides before I talk or something like that. You can definitely use cinnamon topically in clays and powders. And speaking of powders, a cinnamon powder on the teeth for or oral health can be really, really helpful. You can make your own cinnamon tincture. I would tincture the bark. Um, don't just go get the cinnamon from the grocery store, y'all. Buy cinnamon from a reputable herb supplier um, and make sure you're getting something really, really fresh. You'll start to notice the difference the more you get into this because oftentimes what you're seeing in the grocery store in the McCormick's or whatever has been sitting there for two years in a warehouse or more. And then it goes to the store shelves and it sits there and then it sits there and it's been broken down so far into this fine little powder to get through the tiny little spike or the tiny little holes at the top of that container that you're really missing out um, on a lot of the medicinal value there. So warning. <laughs> and contraindications for cinnamon mamas that are pregnant it can cause miscarriage uh so do not take it medicinally do be okay eating some cookies over the holidays and some pumpkin pie it's okay in culinary doses if you are dealing with night sweats and hot flashes my menopausal ladies you might not like cinnamon consider that uh you might still like it Pay attention. Um, if you feel digestive upset, stop using it. <laughs> it's these really challenging things. Um, and then cinnamon essential oil is extremely highly concentrated. As a matter of fact, that cinnamon ergonon stuff that I told you about, Jennifer Wiebush, um, has a cinnamon essential oil in it. And my doctor gives it to me. Um, it's insane. <laughs> it's really, really potent. So if you are ever going to get into a cinnamon essential oil, you really want to do like one drop to 50 milliliters of a carrier oil and be very cautious. Let's talk about mint. It's our last herb, guys. I wanted to start with or end with some dessert-like herbs. Um, let me take a sip of tea because I'm getting thirsty. I love mint. I drink mint a lot. I drink mint with my rosemary and my go-to cola and my ginkgo biloba and my nettles and my ashwagandha and my red clover every day. And sometimes I added vitex and red raspberry leaf and nettles, more nettles and holy basil to that same blend. It's as much I am. <laughs> um, but mint has a very, very long history also. It was first mentioned in Chinese literature for its medicinal value in 659 C E in the Tang Pen Cell. I could have totally murdered how that was pronounced, but I did my best. I apologize if anybody would be offended by that. Um, it was also used by the Greeks and the Romans and the eclectic physicians. It's been used for headaches and for fevers and toothaches and nausea and digestive upset. Native Americans still use it today and they would use it for things like col colic and arthritis and body aches and really so many reasons to use mint. It is still very much loved and valued for its food and medicine. Mint, the mint family, the Lamiaceae family is a very, very broad and wide family, but you are welcome to use peppermint primarily, mentha piperita, mentha x piperita. Um, spearmint is also lovely. You can use brook mint. There's a lot of mints that you can use. Um, ba -ba Let me see, peppermint, it also has lots of calcium, iron, magnesium, potassium, protein, vitamins A and C and many other nutrients. Plus, it is delicious. It's a great after-dinner mint because it's awesome for digestion. <laughs> what is it, right? In our culinary herbs. So funny. Um, this is a really great one for any mamas that are dealing with morning sickness. Peppermint can really be a valuable ally to you. It's really great for tummy cramping, colicky babies, diarrhea, gassiness, um, other upset tummy issues, food poisoning. It's loaded with the volatile oils that make it a wonderful carminative herb. It's great for intestinal cramping. You can use it if you are dealing with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Um, 
It's a powerful herb. It does a really great job of um, easing spasms in the smooth muscle tissue. So that's your digest digestive tract specifically. So that's where the cramping comes from. And it can be a really, really, really good friend in that department. I love mints for cold and flu, especially with our kiddos, because it is so darn tasty. It's pretty easy to get them to use. Having a little mint to do an herbal steam can work wonders for sure. And it does have some um, gentle antiviral properties to it. So not like as potent as, let's say, garlic or elderberry, but just fantastic for our wee wee little ones. It's really nice. Um, it is specific for lower respiratory tract infections and upper res respiratory tract infections. It's a great diaphoretic. It's a wonderful, wonderful plant to have on hand for young kiddos. Again, it happifies their taste buds, but it's going to reduce a fever. It's going to fight off the viruses. It's really great for seasonal allergies. Um, it's yummy. That's so important. <laughs> What else do I want to say? And of course, it's it's great for, no, I already said digestive upset. There's tons of ways you can use mint. There's tinctures, there's glycerides, there's honeys, there's syrups. I highly recommend doing a syrup or a honey. Just is going to be delicious. Um, you could do an apple cider vinegar extract that would put a fun spin on things for sure. You could do a glycerite. Um, of course, you can make a mint tea. I think we all know that. <laughs> if you don't, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> uh, uh, now, if you were to do a honey, would it be just like if you were to do like the garlic or the ginger? Just do the infusion um, and let... You certainly could. You could also take like we were talking about, I'm not sure if I mentioned it in oregano or thyme, but taking like one to two drops of the essential oil into a couple, two to four tablespoons of a raw honey, mixing that up and then utilizing that in a tea yeah. or something along those lines could be really, really helpful. Okay. Um, and yes, you could infuse the dried plant matter. You've got medicine making mama, so you know how to do it with the fresh plant matter too right. yeah. and make sure that you aren't introducing any mold or bacteria and making sure right oh, yeah wouldn't that be delicious though a little yes i mean gosh i mean i can just taste it in my tea i know you know just oh gosh hmm so good. Are Yay, good. Yeah, I'm definitely going to be sending along some great recipes for you guys. I got a sage oxymel, a peppermint fever reliever tea, yeah. um, rosemary Brussels sprouts. There's going to be some extras in there too that I wasn't able to cover in today's class that we'll talk about cold and flu and then get you some cool recipes for those other herbs as well. So horseradish, fennel, um, mm, Cayenne, a few others that I'm missing too. Um, so those will be on the way to you soon. And oh yeah, the, the cinnamon bears that are a really fun treat for your kiddos. And then for our mint contraindications, uh, mint can definitely aggravate people dealing with indigestion or acid reflux, heartburn, those kinds of things. So please use caution there. If you have blocked bile ducts, um, that's supposed to have a T at the end. Mint is not your friend. And if you're allergic to mints, don't take them. <laughs> and okay. That is some of the herbs that we can get amazing medicine from that we cook with on a regular basis. Honestly, I wanted to share a lot more. So maybe I'll do a part two of this class as an, a bonus sometime soon. Um, there's just so much, y'all. There's so much to share. Um, that's the beauty of it. <laughs> Are there any questions. I know I covered a lot. I went really fast. Um, so hit me up while you got me here. Yay, Jennifer. I'm so glad that it was fun for you. You deserve fun. You hardworking mama. We all deserve fun, right? Yes, we do. I'm going to do the fun this evening. I'm going to a coach's meeting. I'm really hoping that I can get my daughter to play basketball this year. So 
I'm going to go to a coach's meeting. She's at Nana and Papa's right now. So I could get work done this weekend, which didn't work out well. <laughs> I still didn't get the work done like I wanted to, but um, I really hope I can get my kiddo to play basketball. And she's, she's very strong and has a very athletic build. And I was a very athletic young child and her dad is still very athletic and um she hates to try anything new. <laughs> if it's not her idea, she will not do it. No matter what it is. Nope. I don't like that. You've never done it. <laughs> so she, we got her a basketball quite a while ago and she's been playing with it and just like rolling it, laying down on the couch and like rolling it from her feet down to her, her chest, you know? And I'm like, Ooh, let's get this kid out there. And she went out and dribbled the ball a bunch with dad the other day. She's like, I only like dribbling. Baby, you got to do more than that. And then he got her shooting baskets and she was making them. And anyways, I'm usually pretty good at doing some psychological trickery with her to get her to play and then at least do it once. I'm like, you got to do it once. Come on. <laughs> Basketball was huge for me when I was a kid. I, I loved it. So I'm hoping I can get her to play. And I always, I, I tend to fall into the coach's role in these kinds of scenarios. So might as well just get there from the start. <laughs> okay. I hope you guys learned a lot today. I hope I didn't go too fast. I know I covered a lot. Um, and I'll consider a part two for this at some point in time. I'll get you guys a bunch of recipes that you can play with. I really hope that it triggered you to get really creative. And when you're cooking all of your feasts this coming week, you're thinking about how much good medicine you're cooking with. I think that is so fun. And again, so overlooked. Like there is so much going on in, in these foods. I know that whenever I make my chicken and dumplings and when it's time to add the sage, it's going to be at the very end. Mm, that sounds so good. <laughs> oh yeah, that's yes. delicious. Yum, yum, yum. What am I I, I do have one quick question here. Uh, buckthorn. What is buckthorn? No. Why don't you put that in the Q and A? I'll do. I'll do okay. more research. Yeah. It's not something I use a lot of. I mean, okay. I know a lot of herbs, but there's no way I can ever know all of them. I've heard about it a lot, but I don't okay. Know why. I bought something this past weekend. It's a face serum, mm. and it's got it's all this. It's got hand press, Louisiana pecan oil, apricot kernel oil, C buckhorn oil, prickly pear oil, and vitamin E oil. Cool. And so uh, I'm just like, um, well, let me ask Mel about this. I went ahead and bought it. It was only $18, but. Nice. I'm about to make a big old batch of facial oil. I might, I might sell it. Like my daughter's got like a family uh, cultural night, multicultural night at, for her homeschool community. And um, I need to make some for myself. So I'm like, well, I might as well make some and sell. And do that kind of fun stuff. We'll see. Just because yeah. now that I'm not running it all as a big product business, I can create and formulate for fun, <laughs> which is really great. Yeah, it's definitely sea buckthorn. Um, and I just don't know much. Yeah, about it that. is. That's what it says. Sea buck yeah. buckthorn. Yeah. Maria, um, sorry to cut you off, Carol. I was going to no, read no, no, Maria's okay. comment. I am glad you showed up. I'm glad you're in Apothecary Mamas. And it sounds like we're going to get to learn all kinds of fun things with you. So I'm excited. Thank you for being here. Um, and I will aim to get those replays up to you guys ASAP. I'll actually be training Jennifer on how to do that very soon. <laughs> so she could do it for me much faster than I can. So, um, yeah, thank you, Terry. And I wish you all a magnificent Thanksgiving. And I'm going to get going. You too, so Mel. Have a great thank one. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Bye. Bye.